Good morning, everybody. Wisconsin's 25th District Senator Romaine Quinn is our very special guest today. Thursday, March 30th. It's March 30th. Holy cow. Uh, 2023. For DrydenWare.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and we are streaming this month's live chat with Senator Quinn, which we do these the last Thursday of every month on our Facebook page. But if you can't watch the whole show, a recording of this will be posted on our website at DrydenWare.com. Uh, well, of course, we'll stay on our Facebook page. We'll also have it on our YouTube channel and on our Twitter account. As always, if you have a question for Senator Quinn or if you have a topic that you would like for us to discuss, please feel free to let us know in the comments during today's live show. Hey, Romain, good morning. Morning. How's it it is March 30th. We're about to get more snow, I heard. <laughs> I know. Kenneth, oh, his son, the first Never thing he said this morning, like, seriously. Right? Really? <laughs> I know. Yeah, no kid. And good morning, Joanne. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is going to start chiming in. Hey, how's it going, man? It's been a month. Uh, it looks like you're in your office. I am. Yeah, things are good. We're just really, really busy. You know, as we talked before, it's budget time. So every group's in here wanting to meet to talk about all their priorities. And, you know, if they had asks that are fiscal in nature, now's the time to bring it up because now's the time where. We're crafting the budget for the next two years. So the state does a budget every two years, not one. Thank God. We only do this once every two years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now's the, now's the but, busy time of the spring for sure. Okay, so that's something we should probably talk about is budget. And by the way, that you're down there right now, Fitzy will be happy. He doesn't like it when elected officials are, <laughs> are not down there like <laughs> passing laws and doing stuff. Oh, oh funny. Yeah. He's, well, he, I would argue that sometimes you don't want us here because if we're all here, it's an opportunity for us to screw something up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there is that. There is. Yeah. Uh, so I have a few things that I, uh, I wrote down uh, just for random topics. So speaking of Fitzy, so I want to get to this right away. Uh, yep. We On our show on Tuesday, we were talking about Swan and Call, so I just want to get your thoughts on that as well. But then it uh, kind of morphed into or, or it just kind of evolved into a general topic about gun control and et cetera. So I have some things that I kind of want to touch on with that. Sure. But first, swatting calls. I don't know. I'm sure you saw. Obviously, this is in your district. Uh, how many of these schools or how many of these swatting calls in the last week or so have been in your district? I know two at least, right? Spooner and, and Rice Lake. Has there been any others? Gosh, I, I thought I heard Superior, but I'm not sure. But yeah, Spooner and Rice Lake, and then I know in the southern part of the state there was uh, there was more as well, yeah. which is unfortunate. Yeah. So, is there anything there from a legislative standpoint, uh, or is it? Hey, man, FBI will do their job. It is what it is. It's it's horrible. It's terrible, etc. But we can't as, as lawmakers do anything necessarily. It's already illegal. What do you, what else can we do? Yeah. So when I was still in the assembly, like you mentioned, it is illegal. We actually passed a bill that increase the penalties for doing that um it's already a felony and we increase the classification of a felony um one for making the call and two if someone is hurt because of it um so if you recall part of this stems from we had a swatting call in the building down here when i was in the legislature we were on the assembly floor when we were all evacuated someone called in a bomb threat and said they were blowing the place up so we all left we stopped session everyone left the building it took probably two hours to sweep the whole thing um, and realizing it was fake, um, which thank God it was fake, yeah. you know, whether it's a school call in or wherever it is. Um, but yeah, this stuff happens. I don't know what kind of, kind of person gets off on something like that, but clearly they need help and it is a felony to do that. So if you thought about it, don't do it. Um, you could go to prison. Good. And by the way, did they ever catch that person? Because I never really hear of anyone getting caught for this stuff. Or it's rare that, that I, I hear it. That I don't know. It's tough. Like you said, it's um, law enforcement has a tough job, whether it's swatting or, you know, white collar bank fraud. It's, you know, sometimes it's hard to really nail these people down. Yeah. Uh, so, the, uh, again, that conversation then kind of because of the uh, shooting in Tennessee, it kind of evolved into a topic about gun control. Um, oh, great question, Joanne. We'll get to that in just a second here. Um so the gun control is, uh, is this a conversation I should really be having with Congressman Tom Tiffany when he comes on for our monthly show? Is this a federal level? They're talking about it there. Or is there stuff that Wisconsin can do? If they choose to, fine or not, that's fine. Just is this really an option 
And if so, sure. what options are there for a state to do, in this case specifically, of course, Wisconsin? Yeah, I think there's a number of measures any level of government can do. It's just a matter of what is the public appetite and then what, how far are you willing to potentially infringe on a person's right to own a firearm and defend themselves? So, you know, part, I think it's important for us to take the situation in Nashville and get all the details and analyze it, right? Is this a person that could legally own a firearm? If so, why? If not, why? Did they obtain it legally? Did they steal it? Um, did they pass a background check? Did they not? Was this person on the police radar ahead of time um, or not? And then why or why not? And then when we break all those things down, then we can maybe look at what are potential solutions to stop someone like that from doing that again. But that's the question, right? So for instance, what if she had stolen that firearm from her parents? Should her parents have had that locked in a safe with a key that wasn't accessible to her? So we've seen bills in Madison in the legislature that says if you have someone in your home under 18, all of your firearms have to be locked up 24-7. Well, as you know, Ben, a lot of us grew up with parents that had firearms around the yep. door, in yep. the closet, etc. And we know there are cases where youth have found them and accidentally fired them and harmed themselves or their siblings, right? So it's a it's a very fine line of safety versus the, being able to apply this in a self-defense situation. So we're not going to pass that bill and overnight make a lot of Northern Wisconsinites felons because they may have a shotgun in a closet next to the front door. Um, and should they have to keep that in a safe 24-7? I don't know if, if that's our job, right? But if that gun gets stolen now, is that person liable if it's used in a crime? Um I would argue not. I, I would mean, think not. I mean, I'm just thinking about it like like a car. If somebody steals, you know, a kid steals their parents' car and then goes and right. runs someone over, are the parents held liable because their keys are out? Now, I'm, I'm sure that's a terrible analogy. I, but analogies help me just kind of process through things. Sure. I I, I, I don't really think so. But a well, lot I mean, of there's this... people that want to hold, you know, gun manufacturers accountable, right? I mean, is it the manufacturer's fault that someone used a tool, a gun as a tool, uh, especially for those of us in northern Wisconsin, you know, is it their fault for making it versus the user that used it to commit that's a crime? Silly. I don't think so. Oh, that's weird. Um, I mean, you know but, me, I don't like guns. I don't own guns. Uh, ugh. But come on, that's silly. Yep. So, I mean, I was at a, our parish council meeting the other night, and we talked about this. And I think, like in Nashville, that shooter forced her way or his way um, into the school through some glass doors. And so we brought that up, too. You know, what... How is the church secured? How is the the, chul, the school secured? St. Joe's and Rice Lake, mm. you know, and we have those glass protectors on there where it would take an immense amount of effort to even get through it. It can be shot, it'll shatter, but it'll never fall apart. So you yeah. can never actually enter the building. So, I, I mean, is that a solution to everything? No, but I think we should take every step we absolutely can to secure our kids and our children the best we can before we go down the road of, you know, are you infringing on someone's ability and right to defend themselves by owning a firearm? Yeah. And so that's and, why when I was in the, in the assembly, we, we spent a hundred million dollars to harden our schools, to require that our schools have a safety that's plan. Right. They run that safety plan by the department of justice and they can apply for grants that would go into capital. Maybe it's cameras, maybe it's locked doors. Maybe it's that material you put on your windows and your doors. Um, you know, a whole host of things where, it's actually unique. I think the Hayward district does that now where the sheriff's department can actually zoom in and monitor their cameras for them. So in the event of a live event, dispatch is watching the whole school wow. as the police are entering. So I thought that was pretty neat. So why, why does our sheriff's department not have access to our cameras in every school in their county, right? So we know if there's a call, we can actually see, is there an active shooter? Because Dispatch is watching the whole school right now as officers are responding. Yeah. So I think there's ways we can we can obviously always do a better job. Yeah, and I, I mean, because it is such a topical thing, we could talk about this. Oh, we really should continue to have this discussion. Maybe next month because we have a lot to get to. Obviously, there's a, a race coming up. We already had a couple of questions regarding uh, Dan Kelly and uh, Janet. Uh, there's a state rival thing, but. Before we move on from this, because, man, I really would love to just do a whole show just on this. 
But we were talking about on that show on Tuesday about what are the answers. Uh, I know in federal, you know, right now they're talking about banning, or I don't think we have already. I don't really follow that stuff about assault rifles. So I actually looked up this morning in terms of like percentage of an assault rifle being used in a mass shooting. And it was on a website and it like tracked everything. And I think it was like since 19, is it the 96 or 66, something like that. It was like a three to one ratio of weapons that were used in not just school, but any mass shootings, three to one ratio were pistols, which I was a little surprised by. Sure. But I don't hear that conversation because most people don't use that for hunting, right? I mean, is that kind of one of the arguments like, well, AR, you know, a lot of people use it for hunting. Okay. People don't usually use pistols for hunting. And that is the by far preferred weapon in these shootings or the weapon that is used. But there's no discussion about that. Are we having the wrong discussion when it comes to uh, which weapons we're looking at? Yeah, that I guess I can't answer that, but you're right. And that's why I think we should look at the totality of every case and make that determination. Now, I would argue that the Second Amendment and your right to defend yourself had nothing to do with hunting, right? It was to defend you and your family from, I mean, right, we fled right. a king and we wanted to make sure a, a tyrannical government was never imposed upon us. Again, it was your right to defend you and your family and it had nothing to do with hunting. But if you want to make that argument, you could say, you know, most people don't hunt with a pistol. You know, a lot of hunters carry them in the woods with them. Um, again, sometimes for self-defense or if you have to dispatch an animal that's that's wounded. Um, but dispatch no one doesn't talk animal. about that. Because frankly, love... it doesn't politi- fit a political narrative, right? Yeah, I you get know, it. You only have to go after the scary, the scary weapons. Yeah, and then one more on this. We were talking about it in terms of specifically schools. Because, again, this was kind of started with the swatting incidents in our area. Thankfully, they weren't. Well, obviously, swatting, it means that they weren't actually real. Uh, real situations or real incidents, but um, how do we, what is the answer there for uh, securing our schools more? And is one of those options, um, I don't want to get into arming teachers, that's a whole other thing, but having an armed guard at every single school that is, you know, checking people, you know, in and out, is that something that you are open to or, man, I love that or I hate that? And then if, Regardless of whatever the, that answer is there, is that something that has been brought up to anyone or down there, your legislators, your peers have brought up that topic because someone's got to pay for this? Yep. Yeah, no, it's been discussed. Uh, and, you know, the arming teacher piece right now, legislatively, you can't. It's against the law. Districts don't have that ability. I think in the past we've looked at that bill and there was just not the political capital to do it. Again, not requiring it, but allowing the school district to make your own determination. Um, there's a lot of schools that already do employ a school resource officer, maybe part-time, not full-time. Um, and again, I think that's a, that's a budget discussion that schools have to make. And I mean, we've seen like districts like Madison terminate their agreements because they think having cops in schools is bad or, um, it intimidates the kids or things like that. And it's like in our world, in the real world, um, our school liaison officers have relationships with kiddos and yeah. staff and teachers. And they're a part of that school community. They're an asset. They're not a liability or whatever, right? And we don't want to turn our schools into jails, right? That's not the not the point of schools. But um, I think that is something. So right now, like we require a reading specialist in every district, right? Could we require a school resource officer for every district? Well, and in this case, um, I think we were talking about it, like right now, a lot of them have a school uh, resource officer. But this would be a separate thing. Because yep. you, you wouldn't want them walking around. You already have, or ideally, like Rice, like uh, Officer Andy, right? They've got uh, 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 the school resource yep. officer, and he does a great job. But this would be different. Like, it would just be an armed guard at the very beginning. Like, I don't know. I just didn't know if that sure. has been discussed or not. And because I can't even imagine how much that would cost. I don't know. But there, it's one of those, there's some feel-good things, right? A lot of that stuff comes out. And it's, we all want to do something to help and protect our kids, obviously, but there, there doesn't really seem to be a silver bullet. Whoop, that's probably bad (laughs) phrasing there, but there doesn't seem to be, (laughs) um, the, okay, we can all get behind this. Yep. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, you got to thread the needle. It is tough. There's some people that don't want to do anything. There's some people that want to go too far, frankly, and then it gets wrapped up into politics and then nothing gets done. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up with a question here because it's on topic. Uh, Sherry asks, do you support a red flag law in Wisconsin? 
definitely not the way it's been written in the past. I mean, it's almost backwards where the government takes your weapon and you have to prove you have a right to own that versus them having to prove you're no longer capable of owning it. So I, I, the way it's been proposed in Wisconsin in the past, absolutely not. So it sounds like you may be open to the, you're open to the concept of it, but not the way that it's been presented up till now. Right. Okay. Um, speaking of guns, uh, uh, Representative yep. Dave Armstrong, uh, who's in your former assembly, uh, was at the 75th Assembly District, 75th. Yep. Uh, he had a press release we published last week, and I think your name was in it there as well, and it was regarding a gun, uh, about Wisconsin having a, a state gun, which honestly oh, I didn't yep. know we didn't have. Uh, we have a, you know, a state everything, so I just assumed we already had one of those things. Um, now, obviously, the, the optics maybe aren't great, and the timing of this maybe not look as well, but I was just curious why this was brought up, and also, uh, I saw a, somebody sent me a link to a story then it was a, 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 oh, it was a Burnett County Sentinel, I think, the editor there, Gary oh, something, or yeah. I don't remember his name, um, had done this, like one of those editorial things or uh, um, from a publisher's desk. Uh, editor, what's that? <laughs> it was trash. Okay, good. I was going to ask if you had seen it. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, a lot it. of people didn't seem to be super happy with that. Uh, yep. And it ties directly into this. Um, right. So you did see that. So first, for people who don't know, what is this about? Yeah, so Henry Fire, Repeating Firearms is a gun manufacturer. A lot of people know what Henry Firearms are. And they have a footprint right in Rice Lake. Now, their headquarters, I think, are still in Jersey, but they're, they've been slowly trying to get everything here, and they've expanded manufacturing into Rust County in Ladysmith. And so they make great firearms that have been around forever, right? Mm -hmm. And it just happened that last year, their 4570 was voted coolest thing manufactured in Wisconsin. So we thought, how awesome would it be to take the coolest thing made in Wisconsin, manufactured by a local company who treats their employees, employees very well. I have friends and family that work there. And it's tied to our great traditions of hunting and enjoying the outdoors, right? The sure. 4570 is a, is a deer rifle. Makes so sense. we said, why not make the 45, Henry 4570 our state rifle i think that'd be cool you know mm -hmm. and all of a sudden my colleagues from madison on oh, milwaukee you know where there's it's a different world right it is it totally um, is instantly tie that to gun violence right so i don't know of anyone that's been shot with a henry deer rifle ever and to tie that to their own issues in their district is just i, I don't i don't have the words for it right so it's just it's not professional. It's unbecoming. It's you're meshing two issues that are totally not related. And then I thought, found that very interesting that the editor from the Burnett County Sentinel latched onto that as well, which doesn't surprise me because he tried to hijack a listening session with Representative Sapphic and I. Um, but it's unfortunate because it has nothing to do with gun violence. It has nothing to do with issues in Milwaukee or Madison. It has nothing to do with the NRA or ginning up the base, right? I think someone posted that uh, you're just trying to gin up your Second Amendment base. It's like, what? One, one I've already got the base. <laughs> oh, and, two, right. Right. and two, we're recognizing a great Wisconsin company, and their motto is made in America or not at all. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. That if Henry Rifles are not made in America, they will not make them ever. Like, that's something we should all support. And unfortunately, again, politics... Uh, gets in the way of some of that. So mm. we've actually invited the governor to come up and tour Henry. I hope he can meet with the people, walk through the factory. Um, granted, I, I'm sure he doesn't hunt. He certainly doesn't fish based on the pictures of how he holds them <laughs> at the fishing opener. Um, but to come up and tour it, like it's not not political. Leave the bubble, come to reality, you know, leave Dane County and uh, come meet with us. So hopefully he's willing to to entertain that and, and we'll keep in touch on that. Is it getting any traction? I mean, is it... Uh... Uh, yeah, we've got lots kind of, of legislators calling, wanting a tour. You know, no people kidding. think it's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, if we wanted to make the uh, the Lineys the Wisconsin state beer, it doesn't mean I think everyone should be an alcoholic or drink and drive. You know, oh, it's like, right. what does that have to yeah. do with And that anything, kills a lot more right? people every year. You know, alcohol does than whatever the name of that gun, 4570. Right. But they're just not even related. And it's, an, again... Going back to even our first conversation about, you know, gun control is 
the politics just poisons everything. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, it is. All right. Anything else that you want to talk about regarding those two things? Because uh, I want to get into... Uh, we had some questions at the very beginning here regarding Dan Kelly and stuff. So obviously there's uh, the vote is going to be on Tuesday. Yep. And so we'll start off right here is uh, two questions. One, this is from Joanne. I have a question. What do you think of those ads on TV attacking Daniel Kelly? Which, by the way, I've only seen one that was against Janet. One. And I've seen like 200 yep. of the other ones. So it's crazy. Yep. I'm like, I, again, I must be wrong, watching the wrong channels because that's all I see are the, you know, things of Dan Kelly and he's the worst yeah. and they morph horns out of his head. Okay. They don't do that, but it might as well be. So and what do you, you're right. <laughs> so what do you think of those ads uh, on TV attacking Daniel Kelly is the question. Yeah. So I have to be careful on the political side of things. Cause I am in my office um, talking to you today, but I will say that I have personally spoken with Dan Kelly multiple times, even about these ads and they're, they're crap. Right. Um, you know, he wasn't making money off of protecting sex offenders. Um, he was a part of a, that law firm that represented people, but he never took any of those cases to trial. Things like that, like literally blatant lies. And it's frustrating because a lot of people say, well, why doesn't he respond? Because he doesn't have the same kind of money as a Janet Protasiewicz does. And we know that I think 95% of all of her money have come from New York and California. Literally just this last week, George Soros, the right... So Republicans Soros. boogeyman, right? And just like uh, the left has the Koch brothers. Yeah. George Soros literally just dumped a million dollars for Janet. The governor of Illinois, Pritzker, is a billionaire, just dumped a million dollars in for Janet. And so the Kelly campaign does not have the resources to rebut all the garbage that we see on our TVs. Now, mm. it is what it is. There's nothing yeah. we can do about that, but you can't buy votes. So I'm not telling you who to vote for, but I would yeah. encourage you to show up on Tuesday, yeah. April 4th. And I'm assuming that would be a similar answer because Suzanne asked, and the ones attacking Janet. Again, I've only seen one of those, and I don't even think it was really attacking. I can't remember. I just remember thinking, hey, there's one. And that was the last one I saw, and that was, I don't know, two weeks ago. Yeah, I know they had a debate, and she claimed that the things yeah. Justice Kelly were saying were not true. Well, then the transcripts came out, and it's literally right. quoting. Come to find out it all was true. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're, you know, your court proceedings are recorded, so it happened or it didn't. You know, whether yeah. you remember it or not. Um, but yeah, I know there's there's mudslinging on both sides. I get it. All right. Um, yeah. But it's there's... an important race because I will tell you this. The legislature's ability to function independently as a co-equal branch of government is at risk. Because here's a perfect example. I was at a meeting off-site, um, off-site meaning unrelated to state business campaign site. And I literally listened to one of my colleagues in the Senate talk about how don't worry, don't even get to know that new freshman you just met because we're going to draw him out of his seat when we win in April and draw new maps. Like that's how blatantly open they are about the things that they know they're going to get done with an activist court. And so they know they can't get the votes in the legislature, so they're just going to circumvent it and, and go to the courts for reprieve. So I hope people keep that in mind on their choice when they go vote on April uh, how does this work now? So um, obviously there's a lot of things. So people that would be uh, supporting Janet, which again, perfectly fine, or be planning on voting for her. I kind of feel like abortion, that topic is the, uh, that trumps everything else. So uh, sure. for example, if someone is a uh, pro-life, but also uh, believes that the maps are gerrymandered, which is a perfectly valid uh, argument, so therefore, it's like, well, Janet's kind of already said what she would, uh, you know, she also thinks the maps are all wrong, but also kind of, you know, where she is on abortion. I don't really know anyone that would be, I'm pro-life, but I want the maps to be drawn more fairly. So I think I'll vote for Janet because of that. I think the abortion topic actually is the thing that would trump the, the everything else. You're but right. the one thing I don't know is, how does this work? So let's just play this forward. Judge Janet, she wins. She's in. You just can't walk in and say, okay, now we need to go back to all those other things you guys ruled on and we're going to re-rule on those. So yep. how does this actually, how would that play out in terms of uh, having a different outcome for our abortion laws yep. in Wisconsin? Perfect. Yeah. No, it's a good question. So outside groups will file a lawsuit and they will litigate in hopes to get it in front of the Supreme Court and get the ruling they want. So it's not even just 
the abortion issue, right? Which again, I will argue is not a decision to be made by the judicial branch. It's a political question on what society views that issue should be, and that should lie with the legislature. And if you don't like what the legislature is doing, you then, get rid of them, right? Right, vote for so, someone else. So it'll be Planned Parenthood, it'll be some kind of advocate, it'll be someone that, they'll find someone that claims their rights are being violated, they'll run it up the totem pole, and my fear is we will have what happened in Kansas. So I, we are a purple state, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Kansas is a much more conservative electorate. And when they lost their Supreme Court, not only did their abortion laws go out the window, it's any time for any reason and paid for by taxpayers. And that's not where the majority of the public is either. And so that's the point. The legislature should be deliberate and say, should it be allowed after six weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks? Um, what about cases of sexual assault? You know, those are decisions that have to be hammered out. And no one's in the camp, not many, are in the camp of any time, any reason, for no reason at all, up until the point of birth. But that's literally what we could get if the court determines, somehow finds a constitutional right in our constitution which is really absurd to me because Wisconsin became a state in 1848. And why would the legislature or the people writing our constitution think there was a right to an abortion when they passed a law in that same time period banning all abortions, basically, right? Mm. And so to say there was legislative intent in the founders of the state of Wisconsin um, is like, no, <laughs> it's not. But when you, when you use the courts to achieve a political outcome, you don't care, right? Because you, you want that outcome. But yeah. my, my plea is always don't burn down the system to achieve your end, right? Use the political system the way it was designed to achieve the outcome you want. Convince your neighbors and friends. Get them to the ballot box. Um, make a difference and change and sell your idea. You don't just find, file a lawsuit and, and vote for f four people on a court that will get you what you want. Yeah. How, how When that comes, and maybe, maybe this is something you don't know, this isn't your world, uh, the judicial side of it, but isn't there an, uh, an appeals process as well? Wouldn't that, uh, I don't know how that works. Like what, does like everything go to an appellate court? <clears throat> or, and I think we have several of them, so I don't know like how that gets determined, which one. But I think a, I think appeals courts only have three judges, if, I'm, if I remember. Maybe it's five. I think, well, there's I think... no appealing past the state Supreme Court. Got it. That's what I, wait a minute. Yep. On the state issue. Now, there have been some, like I think the maps, like our last maps, Went to the uh, well, the masks as well, the, right? Because wasn't what's his name? Uh, 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 well, that was a specific thing uh, right up here. So it's kind of Judge Yackel. He was he did something and then it went somewhere and then something about appeals court and they overturned a ruling or something. Yeah. So, like for instance, the um, the lockdown order, the overreach there. You know that was finalized at the state supreme court. So oh, there, could a, there could be a there could be. You know, okay. opportunities to appeal past the state Supreme Court, but I just, I don't see the, the pathway for that. Okay. I also saw a headline this morning, so speaking of the elections, that was the, there's another race, not in our area, but the, I think it said the 8th Senate District. I don't know where that is. And somewhere in the headline was about uh, super majority at stake. And it was yep. the Senate stuff. So what is this? Because I didn't actually click and read on it, but I remember I should bring that up to you. Yeah, so when I won this race... We gained 22 seats in the state Senate. So we are at a super majority. Afterwards, Alberta Darling has been in the legislature for decades. Um, yeah. She chose to retire, I believe, for health reasons and family reasons. Sure. So right now there is an open um, election that will take place on April 4th, next Tuesday, um, to fill that seat. And it's a fairly even seat. Republicans have held it for quite some time. But again... They're being outspent two to one, three to one, uh, you know, hammering whatever issue. And and so we'll, we'll see what that is. Dan Canodal is running. I served with him in the assembly. Stand-up guy. I endorsed him right out of the gate. Um, he'll be a great addition to the state Senate. Uh, so I, I really hope I, I hope we have a positive outcome there. He's a good man. Okay. And that's on April 4th. What, where is this? I mean, 8th, but where is 8th? What's... A county yeah. or a city or something? Or, or just what part of Wisconsin is this? Southeast Wisconsin. So you know how yeah. they don't know where we live? I don't know where yeah, they I don't know where they live. Who cares? <laughs> Obviously, also on the ballot, and this is uh, what Fitz and I think is, well, when we talk, right? We're talking cop stuff. Like super, super duper important, obviously. And those are two questions regarding the cash bail. We touched on a little bit last month 
Yep. But I'm assuming this is a, a, a something that you really want to make sure everybody knows about. It was interesting. Eric Tony sent a submitted uh, post, not because he's uh, used, you know, ran for attorney general or that he's a DA, but he's the president of, I can't remember, DAs or prosecutors, something like that in, in, in Wisconsin. And we put that up and it was interesting to see some of the comments that I was kind of surprised that there was people that were adamantly against this. Sure. I didn't realize that. I'm not kidding. I thought this was like a slam dunk, like everybody can get behind this. So sure. I was a little surprised by that. So what are you hearing when you he see or you hear the pushback or someone, if you tell them, this, I highly recommend, you know, looking at this and voting yes on this. And they say no because of here. What is sure. that reason that somebody wouldn't want to do this? I don't know. I think I did read some of those comments on, on Eric's article. But yeah. again, the point is the judge will continue to have the discretion on how they best believe to protect the community when they're setting bail or keeping someone locked up pre-trial. This doesn't mandate any sentence, doesn't mandate a set amount of bail, right? So if you believe in a judge's discretion, you should vote yes, because right now they don't have the leeway in a lot of instances. If you think the situation's fine now, that a judge should only set bail based on your likelihood to show up in court, not your past record, not the severity of the case, not the risk of the community, then you should vote no if you think that's fine. I would argue that there is a, a public safety concern, which is where this is coming from. So another example, I mean, we talk about the, we have talked on the show, like the Waukesha uh, yeah. parade killing, right? That gentleman had a rap sheet a mile long. He was a threat to the community. He posted bail, very low bail. And a judge could say, well, on his rap sheet, he showed up to court every single time. It's not my job to use bail to keep him off the streets. And so he was let back out in the community and he killed people. And those people are dead today because that judge didn't have the opportunity to maybe set a condition that he should have been allowed to. So that's what this is about. Mm. So I get the concern, you know, if you're... Well, Sherry says the referendum seems to target poor people regarding bail. Do you agree? It says nothing about a person's ability to pay. It's about taking into account your threat to the community. That's yeah, and honestly, I, on and this one, judges, I don't really care if you can pay. I, I don't care. Uh, right. I mean, it's we, we have to think of the community first. I mean, we we just got finished talking about uh, yeah. swatting calls in school and keeping our kids safe. And at this point, I think we're all like, that's fine. Put an armed guard yeah. in front of it. Arm the teachers. I don't care. Whatever we can all say, this is going to stop these things or significantly start to reduce these things. Then I'm yeah. all for it. Even if it's some things I don't necessarily feel comfortable with, I'm all for it. So I, I get, right. the, Sherry, that's an actual, it's a, it's a valid point. It really is regarding uh, if someone is rich or has a lot of money and they can afford the bail. Yeah. But I don't care if you can or can't. That, that, that's irrelevant. We, we just have to do something. We want to give our judges more tools in the toolbox um, and hope they use it wisely. I assume that they will. And again, if your judge is keeping people in jail over a speeding ticket, I mean, judges are elected too. You can get rid of them. Yeah, but right can. now, yeah. judges don't have the authority for more discretion. We're allowing more opportunity for more judicial discretion. Like you said, tools in the toolbox they don't have today. And it's important to remember, Wisconsin is the only state in the country right now with this standard, the only state. And so I don't think it's good to be on an island on this issue. Yeah. Um, and when it was passed in the 80s, it wasn't around, I think they made a mistake. And now the legislature is looking to correct that. Mm. This has been debated thoroughly. This has passed the legislature twice. It's taken over four That's years right. to even get to this point, right? Because constitutional amendments are a big deal. So now the public gets to weigh in and say, you know, should my local judge have a discretion to take into account more issues when determining um, on how best to keep the public safe? Well, as always, everything has to be political. So is this right. something that <laughs> right. uh, Republicans are... Uh, yay, and Democrats are, you know, really against it. I mean, there's always going to be, it seems like, you know, one side sure. is more in favor of and the other side is less in favor of, but is it getting any kind of bipartisan on whichever side? Yeah, it was a bipartisan vote every time. Now, it definitely is split still. There was not a lot of help from the left on this. And again, the arguments on the floor are, well, we're not addressing the root cause of why they committed the crime and this and that. And it's like, I, I get that. Right? I get it, but it's, we it's can a start. Do that. We should do that. But that's not what this is about. Just like 
recognizing Henry Firearm is not about right. people shooting each other. Advocating walk, for mass right? shootings. No. Right. So we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can look at, um, oh gosh, corrections reform, right? Um, programming in our systems, keeping people from committing crimes, supports in the communities, all sorts of that stuff, right? And we're working on that all the time. So we're not saying we're going to do this and then go home and work on nothing else. Like, no, this is one step of many that we're taking to try to address public safety, Yeah, which isn't uh, a, a huge deal here, but it right. is a huge deal in the southeastern part of the state where their carjacking rates. For it's just ridiculous. Uh, Sue yeah. has been commenting here about Medicaid. Is that, uh, is that something that state level does? Yes. Yeah, so the state has chosen, continued to chosen not to expand Medicaid for a number of different reasons. So, Two issues there. She mentioned mental health, which is important. Yeah. There are not enough facilities. There are not enough therapists. And Medicaid does not reimburse them high enough to increase our capacity in northern Wisconsin to have these services. So right now, I just sat down with Representative Green yesterday in my office, and we talked about you know how could we maybe help the hospital in Ashland expand beds from 10 to 16. I think you can't have more than 16 beds where you're considered an institution. Those are the, the beds, right, for people that have those psychiatric breaks where chapter 51, you haul them in because they're a danger to themselves or others. We also need more supports in our schools on up before people get to the point where they're having that break, right? Mm. Where they could be a harm to themselves or others. So we're looking at school-based mental health, expanding those services, uh, wraparound treatments, I mean, outpatient services in the community. Um, but all these issues come together, right? Homelessness is a factor. And when it comes to mental health, you know, having finding someone a stable home, be able to be case managed and connect the dots with those resources that exist in the community to get them on a better path before, you know, they have, you know, further issues, right? So we are absolutely looking into more mental health services for those in our community. But the legislature has chosen again and again, um, it sounds nice. This has come up both my listening sessions, just expand it, money's free. Um, but the problem is there's a number of hidden issues with the expansion of Medicaid no one wants to talk about. And I'll just be super brief. The argument is there's 80 to 90,000 people that would qualify under the expansion. What they're not telling you is those 80 to 90,000 people, half of them already have private insurance through the exchanges and the other half qualify for those plans, which a majority of them are no monthly premiums, period, right? So why would we take people off of a federally funded 100% private plan and put them on a state plan where they're now the state has an obligation? And so one, I don't know why we put the state at risk when those people qualify for insurance. And two, those, pan, those plans pay our providers a higher rate. We know Medicaid does not reimburse for the services like they should. So why, that's why the Wisconsin Hospital Association has been neutral. Because why would we take 90,000 people, put them on a state program that chronically underfunds those services? Mm. So it's, it's not as black and white as some people make it out to be. There are, there are intricate details to this that get left out a lot and you know so what but i would preface that with everyone wants to find ways to expand access to affordable health care yeah everyone. yeah everyone wants everyone to be to be healthy yeah so i, I just want to say that like no one well i don't believe you should have insurance or get the care you and your family need no that's not it it's just how do we achieve that end and the legislature has chosen not to expand Medicaid at this time. You know, so you hear the things, I think someone even said in there, you know, expand coverage, 90,000 people. And we're you, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like a campaign ad, a 30 second ad, and that gets you riled up. You know, I'll fire, but it's, well, slow down. Uh, that's a very good point. But let's actually look into this a little bit further because you wouldn't necessarily, uh, I don't know if I'd say misled, but there's a lot more context here. Let's actually start talking about that, and maybe we should put that on the list too. We really need to start doing these shows a lot more often, because holy sure. cow, we have so many things <laughs> that right. we just can't really get to. Um, yeah. Because Lots I want to ask, because we're getting close to our time anyway. But what is, what bills are happening down there right now? Is there anything that you're working on? Hey, how's that sports betting coming? Are you, are you getting that done for us? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Come out. It's funny you bring that. You bring that up. I know we've talked about it in the past. You know, yeah. so why why can't we sports bet right now in Wisconsin? Why can't I go to DraftKings and just do it from there? And I don't care who takes my money. Just somebody yep. take it. Yeah. So we can't do that because we have compacts with our tribal nations, sovereign nations in the state, yeah. that restricts gambling to only you know their property. Gambling is illegal in Wisconsin. 
um, I would argue that we should be reviewing this. So we have a number of issues going on in northern Wisconsin with, uh, in terms of tribal relations. There was a recent court ruling that tribal members um, on the Bad River Reservation and the other Chippewa bands no longer have to pay property taxes. Um, we have wait what? Yep. Yeah. So, wait. Pro- so if you own land and you're on a, 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 these specific reservations, or like res- reservations all over Wisconsin? Not all over Wisconsin. Okay. So the Lac de Flambeau, the Bad River, the Red Cliff, and the LCO. And so to keep it short, mm-hmm. there's a lot to unpack here. Um, the court ruled that any tribal land that has any percent ownership by um, a tribal member so or owned by them in the past no longer has to pay property taxes. So if you are a non-native and you live on the reservation, you are the only one paying property taxes right now. So for instance, in the town of Sanborn, which basically encompasses the Bad River tribe, all of that tax burden fell on 15% of the taxpayers. Oh. I, I had someone come to my listening session last week, or not last week, last month, that said their taxes went to $22,000 a year. How on earth do you expect people to afford their homes? So right now, Representative Green and I are trying to find ways to backfill these communities because collectively right now, they're short five and a half million bucks. And so this is not something I thought I would be working on when I got down here, um, but these people are getting left high and dry and the governor did not fix it in his budget. Um, so there's a lot of complicated issues that we're working on beyond just the usual gun control or- Yeah, all the hot topics. And uh, these are, I mean, they're important housing. topics. Absolutely, yep. you bet. Yep. But 22,000 for what? I mean, I just can't imagine that like, just one day waking up and yeah, your $3,000 a year went to $22,000 a year. It's, right. uh, yep, I can't live here anymore. Right. And it's interesting um, that now some of the tribes are trying to introduce a new possessory tax, right? So a brand new tax only on on non-natives that live in tribal lands. So So once again, you know, trying to, in my opinion, what's going on is they're trying to drive non-native off. That's literally what I was just going to say, again, outside looking in, and I don't know everything that's going on, just based on what you're saying. I was literally just going to say the same thing, that it seems like it's just don't want these people, which is, that's fine. I, I don't care if you don't want them there, that's fine, but. Right. But in next wow. door, in the Lac de Flambeau, I'm sure you've seen the news articles. That's getting all the yeah. attention. No one's talking about the problems in the 25th. The next Senate seat over, there's been a lot of coverage on the Lac de Flambeau, even on Fox News, yep. where people have been locked out of their homes because a 50 year easement on their road expired. The tribe and the title company cannot come to agreement. So the tribe chose to block the road. So we have people that have not been to their home in months. We've had people who are elderly, who are disabled, who have left their home and are not allowed back. And now the township is paying basically a $20,000 a month ransom to let them in for 90 days um, until we can figure this out. So lots of issues on who was right or wrong in the past, but the point is um, we're all a community and we all wanna live together and we all wanna get along. And so some of these issues are really coming to a head in northern Wisconsin. And um, I guess I'm, I'm glad I'm in here now. So we have a voice at the table through the budget process with some leverage to try and fix some of these. Um, and what frankly, is the fixes? Uh, and I know there's, there's so much we could, like all, all the topics that we've been talking about today are hour-long conversations, each one of them. 100%. But is yeah. there kind of a, that bullet point, like here's a few things that we've been kicking around or some things that have been brought up. Like how does this end? Does this sure. end in court? Does this end in uh, non-native? That's just it's, that's just how it's going to happen. They're going to have to move out, which, you know, it is what it is. And then sure. this, like, there's no change. This is just how it is? No, and I I refuse to accept that this is how it is. So we're working a number of avenues, Boy. I think, through the budget process to hopefully try to get the tribes to come to the table and at least have a discussion. Like, hey, these people are already stuck with 100% of the t- property tax bill. Why on earth are you instituting a brand new tax only on them as well? Um, why is the LCO shutting down snowmobile trails in, in Sawyer County? What? Why? Um, you know, no, so, literally, why? why? What's going on? They're shutting down trails? Right, yeah. So last month, um, Sawyer County was notified that any of the snowmobile trails, a whole litany of them that go across reservation land, um, were closed. Oh, sure. And we know some of the tribes have even talked about implementing new trespassing ordinances. So if you're driving your ATV or side-by-side down the trail and you go off the trail onto reservation land, they could confiscate your machine. 
Now tell me how this is going to end when oh you and your buddies are driving your $20,000 side-by-side machines on a trail and you pull off to have a beer and tribal police take your property, right? So we don't, we don't want these things to happen. And so we're working right now to try to find some solutions to bring people pay to the table. Do the, uh, 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 a tax on it. Pay toll. Right, have a, a little pay toll for some of dealers, and you know when you go on, yeah. our, you want to go through our land, you just got to pay a fee. Problem solved. There See, go. there we go. Here Mark you go. it down. By the way, that Chan's Green—that's we're referring to, right? Yeah. In the seventy, boy, I don't know, seventy fourth. Is that the district? Yep. Is that the right one? Uh, I'm hearing great things about him. I literally haven't talked to him in a year. I've only talked to him one time, but I've had yes. people that are in the area that say. You know, have you talked to Chan's much? Have you ever had him on for a show? And I'm like, you know, I don't think we ever have. I talked to him literally one time about a year ago. But I keep hearing great things about him. Yeah, he's a good guy. He works really hard. He puts the time in both in district and down here. And he's just, he's in tune with his district, which is important. He listens. So anytime I'm in the district, he's there. Um, so yeah, he's doing a, a great job for that area. And it helps to have that counterpart in the legislature to, to, to push on these things. So like the other day, you know, I held a speak a meeting with the speaker to get him up to speed on this. Well, it's nice having Chan's in the assembly that can also communicate these same messages with us saying, sure. Hey, we've got a problem. How do we fix this? Yeah. Together. And being down there, I mean, it's, you know, 80% of life showing up, man. So he does a good job. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So there was that question on the, so how can we fix this tribal stuff? There's more important things unless the Indians, Using bows and arrows. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll skip over yeah, well, that one. It's, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. And, it is. Uh, we've got some stuff in the works, and, and right. hopefully we can remedy this because there's a lot of people under severe financial pain right now in northern Wisconsin, and frankly, no one's talking about them, and that's a shame too. They have a story to tell, and we're going to keep talking about it until we fix this. All right, well, maybe what we'll do, because we did have uh, – because we'll do these monthly, and with the election coming up on Tuesday, we had a lot to actually get to today. We're going to try to stick to like two topics next next month, just two, so we can sure. spend more time <laughs> on them. Yep. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what do you have coming up this weekend? Oh gosh, so, a couple dinners to be at. Um, Sunday's finally quiet. I try to keep Sundays to just at home. So, but every weekend something, that's for sure. Oh, and a plug this um, Monday. We are going to be having a listening session in Bayfield, um, Representative Green and I. Mm. So I've, I've had them with Angie and Superior just this last week in Burnett County. Chans and I have already held one in Ashland, Hurley, Mellon. I've been in Spooner with Dave Armstrong and mm. Barron. And so now uh, Monday will be in Bayfield. Um, so if you are looking for an opportunity to sit down and chat and talk face-to-face on the issues you care about, we'll be there. So... That's the listening session in Burnett with Angie that you were referring to earlier that a, uh, a certain reporter was trying to hijack. Which, by the way, I actually heard about that from two different people. Yeah. And they called and said, did you hear? And I'm like, hear what? Sure. I'm like, oh boy, there was this person there and he was just like hijacking the, the entire listening session and not letting, you know, actual, the citizens actually ask the questions. I'm like, no. Right. And it said, yeah, and Romaine put a stop to it. I'm like, what? I wish I was there. Please, somebody tell strong. me that you actually had a recording of this. Well, he recorded the whole thing. Oh, hey. Yeah. There we but, go. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, everyone <laughs> should have an opportunity to speak, address their legislators, whether you agree with them or not. And so we try to open that time for everyone. And unfortunately, there's always usually a couple of people that want to monopolize the time, which is unfair to everybody else. But we do our best. Yeah. All right, man. Hey, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you in a month. See you in a month. Next month, uh, are you still, when is session like wrapped up? Is there like already, uh, you have a calendar, I'm assuming, like a like yep. a legislative calendar. Is there already a nothing after this date? We could still go longer, but it typically is going to wrap up. I don't know. Is it coming up soon or? Well, I think statutorily the budget's supposed to be done by July 1. And that's always our goal. Our goal is actually sooner. Um, but I'll be down here off and on until that's finished because that's the number one priority right now, because everything we talk about, housing, schools, uh, homelessness, mental health, all budget related. And so we've got to do it now. Um, so that's why we're here every week for many days, making sure we're doing what we need to do that, you know, our issues have a seat at the table. Well, Fitzy will be very happy to hear that when I tell him that next Tuesday, oh. <laughs> that you're down there. 
Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Special thank you to Wisconsin's 25th Senate District Senator Romaine Quinn for joining us for our chat today. Reminder, we chat with uh, Romaine Quinn on the last Thursday of every month. So next month it'll be on the 27th. Uh, I'll see you on Tuesday when Baron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald and I'll be back for our latest weekly Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy show. Uh, I think that's, yeah, it's election day that day, so we'll be doing our election predictions sure to go wrong. So until then, for DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden saying thank you for watching, and as always, have a blessed day.